Hey everybody, happy Thursday. Excited about today's topic. Uh, so we had over 200 people register for this webinar and uh, people kind of join right now. So we see, see some folks joining. So I'm gonna do a quick intro for about the next minute to give everybody time to join. Um, so what we're gonna talk about today is um, a very common problem in the industry, especially for us GRC professionals, uh, where we have to comply or build a uh, build a security and compliance program that poises us to comply with multiple compliance frameworks. So maybe you have SOC 2, ISO, PCI, High Trust, and others, and your team's just feeling a lot of audit fatigue, and you, you want to know what's the strategy to build a, a compliance program that's harmonized across all those requirements that uh, set you up for success. So uh, that's what this is. This is a webinar series about that, and I'll talk about that as we go. Um, as people are joining, if you're not familiar with me or Risk360, so I'm the CEO and co-founder of Risk360. Um, as a business, uh, we kind of have three sides of our business. So we do compliance work. So we are actually the auditor. We issue SOC 2 reports. We work on uh, high trust assessments. We do PCI certification. So we're the auditor behind those kind of things. And then the other side of our business is we're helping organizations build the programs and manage the programs kind of as a compliance as a service function for companies that want to outsource help managing their, their program. So the bottom line is, is uh, as a business and as a practitioner myself, we see both sides of the coin as the auditor, but also as the folks, just like many of you on the webinar today, that have to manage those programs. And that gives us a, a pretty unique perspective on, on how to go about building a multi-framework strategy. I'll use the word single framework strategy as we go, but uh, so, so that's a little bit about Risk360. As we go through this uh, webinar today, Corey already mentioned it, but I have a bunch of downloads and, and freebies for you all. Uh, those are available that you can download um, in the, the GoToWebinar itself. We'll make those available. You can download the PDF or the Word document directly. Also, I'll have QR codes up as we go. So if you want to take a screenshot or, or look at the URL and download those later, you can do that. Uh, also, if you have questions as we go, throw those in the chat. I'll try to uh, leave, leave some time for questions at the end. So uh, we can address those as we go. And I really appreciate when y'all do that because it makes it very engaging. So uh, to kick, uh, kick it off here, let's, let's, uh, let's talk about the problem. What are, we, what are we here to solve? And I alluded to this a little bit earlier, but the bottom line is many of you have a situation where you need to comply. Your business needs to comply with multiple frameworks. The most popular ones we're seeing is stuff like the NIST frameworks, ISO 27001, SOC 2, PCI, I trust, the, the whole slew, the whole alphabet soup of different compliance requirements that you have to manage. And, and the problem that we're seeing from a business perspective, the impact that it's having to many of you is that you have to do things like manage tons of audits. You have to gather thousands of audit artifacts. You're being audited all year round. The frameworks are changing. Just this year, ISO changed and updated the 2022 version. PCI is moving to 4.0. CMMC is coming out. So there's a ton of audit requirements. There's changing frameworks. A lot of us have anxiety that we're missing something. Is everything covered? Um, we're also seeing things like bothering the engineering team too much. They have to get too many screenshots. They're overburdened. They can't do their day job because there's just an extreme amount of audit burden. And ultimately, as, as GRC and security professionals, it's either taking away from our day or ruining our credibility with the rest of the team because it feels like we're the bad guys. We're the audit cops that are coming around trying to make them comply with these frameworks. So we have to have a strategy to get away from that and to support the business. Um, and, and that's what I want to talk about today. So the solution, I believe, uh, is one, have some confidence that this is a fixable problem. Someone sent me a LinkedIn message uh, ahead of this webinar and they were like, hey, I look forward to you trying to solve world peace today because that's kind of what this feels like. It feels like an insurmountable problem that people have been trying to tackle for years and, and, and really are struggling with. But I assure you it is fixable. We have done it and I've seen it done. Um, throughout this webinar, I'll talk about the single framework strategy. That's RISC360's term for this solution, how, how we approach this problem. So if you hear me say single framework strategy, that's what this webinar series is. And I'm talking about the multi-framework problem. Um, and then from a business perspective, I hope that by implementing this strategy, ultimately you can reduce the effort of compliance. Uh, that means your team's effort in particular, your security GRC team's effort, but also the effort of your teams like your HR team, your engineering team, other people who are impacted by audits. And by saving time, you're gonna save money. You're gonna save your business money and you can invest, reinvest that, those dollars and time back into value add activities that are beyond uh, compliance. And I hope that you can also reduce risk. That's why we're in this business. We want to implement things that make sense for the business that also happen to help us comply. 
And uh, as we go through this, this is going to be stuff that you can apply uh, in the real world. This is not theoretical stuff. These are things that I have done myself. Or our team has done four companies and I know it works as practical stuff that will help you implement this strategy. So what is the strategy? All right, so this is a four part series. Um, throughout this year, I will be presenting each of these four parts uh, in a series format. Then we're gonna combine all of this stuff into one course that you all can take for free, probably post it on YouTube, and also as a, a, a ebook or a guide that you guys can apply to your organizations. But this is part one of the four part series. Um, and we'll be doing every, uh, the other three parts over the course of a couple months. So stay tuned for those. But today I wanna talk about governance. I wanna talk about the, this is really the prerequisites to having a successful single framework strategy. And as we go through this framework, I'll, I'll be providing tools that you can download or, or go out there and use. And occasionally I'll refer back to something Risk360 has. For example, we have a platform, Phalanx GRC. I think about half of the attendees today are, are Risk360 customers. So you're already using Phalanx. So if there's a, a, a tool available to you or, or something available to you in Phalanx, I'll refer you back to that so that you can get it. And otherwise it's gonna be a downloadable that you can get or just a strategy you can pull off at your organization. But again, four part series, Make sure you register for the rest of these three parts. And today we're gonna to talk about governance. So governance, I think there's, there's three elements that are prerequisites to pulling off a single framework strategy when it comes to governance. I think you have to establish context. You have to make sure you're aligned to the business. I'll talk a lot about that. This is the step that is skipped. You can't drive organizational change unless you do this. Then we're gonna talk about actually setting up a governance structure. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about security org structure. Um, I think there's some things that might uh, that might surprise you on what you need to do, and some tools that will be very valuable for you as we as we move through this. So, uh, number one, context and business alignment. So, what what does that mean? So, what I've seen at most organization is this is the step that is skipped. We start to think that pulling off a single framework strategy is about mapping control frameworks. The most common question I get is, do you have a mapping between SOC 2, ISO, PCI, et cetera? The answer is yes, we do have a mapping, but that is not how you pull off this strategy. The way that you effectively pull off a single framework strategy is by the ability to have the appropriate infrastructure in place, the people infrastructure, to get management buy-in and drive organizational change. And it, and it takes careful planning on the front end of this to be able to pull the strategy off. So that's why you can't skip this step. You, this is mandatory. So this is where a lot of you are probably going wrong. You're not thinking about the people, the change management, the systems and processes that I have to have in place to pull this off. So I'm gonna talk you through some of those things. I think there's three things when it comes to context and business objective alignment that you need to think about. One is what are your business objectives? Do you know? So we'll talk about that. Um, I wanna talk about the scope of compliance requirements. Um, sometimes mapping between frameworks seems like an easy job until you start thinking about the nuances between the compliance requirements, the scope of each, how do those harmonize? And we'll talk about how to pull that off and then also audit timing and timing of the implementation of your program. So these are the three things that I think encompass context and business alignment. So let's talk about business objectives. I think, I think this is the number one mistake I see GRC professionals make in terms of steps, steps that are skipped that would be highly impactful to pulling off the strategy. And my question is, do you all know what your business's top objective is or top three objectives? And when I talk to most security and GRC professionals, they do not know. Uh, maybe they have some loose idea. Maybe they heard the CEO say something on a conference call. Maybe they have a printout or a one pager, but they're not exactly sure what the business's top objectives are. Maybe they're in acquisition mode. Maybe they're trying to grow top line revenue. Maybe they're trying to do something, but what is that thing that they're trying to do? And once you understand those, those handful of things, the second question is, how does your security and compliance program support them? And I will promise you that your security and compliance program absolutely supports those business objectives. It's just a matter of uncovering them. And the reason you need to know this is because this is how you're gonna drive organizational change and get buy-in across the business to pull off a single framework strategy. And I'm gonna give you some tips how to uncover this information and, and, and how it relates directly back to the single framework strategy. So 
from my experience, when we think about a single framework strategy and a business objective alignment, there are uh, three things that always map back to uh, the business's objectives. And the reason that you exist as a GRC function or a compliance function, a security function, is your goal is either to support risk management. So I wanna reduce the, the risk of a security breach or the likelihood of a security breach, the impact of it. You exist because you want to support customer trust. So you need a certification to support the sell cycle. Maybe you're answering security questionnaires. Maybe you're supporting the product. Or, or your job is to reduce cost and complexity. So you're, you're making the complex compliance requirements simple and you're reducing the efforts to comply. Those three things will absolutely support your business's objectives. They don't wanna breach, they wanna sell more stuff, and they wanna reduce cost and complexity. Um, the best objective statements I've seen include these elements. So uh, I'm, I'm, I have an example up here. This is GitLab. Um, I'm showing you GitLab's example because they actually make it public on the internet. So this is public information. But they're a great example of a security vision and mission statement that directly aligns to these three functions. And, and I would say every world-class security organization that I've seen are crystal clear about their alignment to one of these three or all three of these things and map that back directly to the business objectives. And the reason that matters is because this is how you're gonna drive organizational change. When you're, when you're talking to the CTO and you wanna do a single framework strategy and you're trying to get their, their buy-in, you need to say, hey, this is gonna save your engineering team thousands of hours. It's gonna save us $100,000. It's gonna make it so easy for you. Well, that's a cost and complexity reduction reason. They're gonna love that. Or you might wanna say, hey, look, by this single harmonized strategy, we're gonna really reduce risk. We're gonna do, we're gonna create a control framework that really supports the business and our actual processes. It's not gonna be a compliance check the box. So we're gonna actually reduce risk. Those are talking points that you need in your arsenal to be able to articulate to business leaders so that when you need to engage them to make this happen, you can. So if your organization hasn't went through this process yet, you don't, you don't know how your security and GRC function maps directly back to business priorities and you can't easily articulate that, I have a, a downloadable coming up. Um, you can also download it if you're, if you're watching the webinar and you're in the webinar live right now, you can download it. It's called the Security Team Operating System. And there's an exercise in there that will help you uncover your security vision and mission so that you can articulate it back to others. And I'll show you a link to that here in just a second, or you can download it. So that's, that's step one. Don't underestimate this step. And then step two, when it comes to context and business alignment, is thinking about the scope of compliance. So I have, I have a very simple example here. This is a very common setup. Maybe your organization has a few business units. You have corporate shared services you offer a SaaS product, and maybe you have a consulting practice that does you know, one-off consulting engagements. And this is what you need to get certified ultimately. And what you find out is you have an ISO 27001 program uh, that everything is required to get certified. It has to have the whole scope. Each of them have business requirements, customers requiring the certification, et cetera, where you have to have the whole organization certified. All right, that's good information. That's my scope. But then you also have a SOC 2 report. Well, it turns out your SOC 2 report only covers corporate shared services in the SaaS product. The consulting practice is completely scoped out. And then lastly, you have a PCI requirement that you've done a really good job of scoping that down to only the SaaS product. You need to know this because as you create your harmonized control framework, each control might have different ap applicability. For example, PCI has a requirement that you do uh, penetration testing and segmentation testing. Well, in this case, the only part of your business that requires that segmentation piece for PCI would be your SaaS product, not the whole organization. Or ISO 27001 has something called an ISMS, as a management system. Well, you know that that needs to cover the whole organization. So this is that nuance that you need to understand so that as you're building out your control framework later in this process, you'll understand what controls you need, what frameworks need to be covered, and what the scope of those controls are. This is a step that's often missed where you try to apply equally all the requirements across the whole business. And when it comes audit time, it can be a little awkward because maybe you're missing stuff. So go through this scoping exercise. Um, if you need help, I have other videos on this. Like for example, uh, ISO 
there's very uh, specific ways you can scope that. We can scope it around the business, include parts of the business, not include other parts. Um, so there's a little bit of art to this that you might not, might need some of that subject matter expertise. But this is an exercise you need to know that's critical to this first step of business alignment and context. The last thing I'll talk about in this step uh, is timing. So the other nuance when it comes to pulling off the single framework strategy is if your goal is to reduce your audit burden, you ultimately need to align your audits, your external audits, and your audit periods. So in this example, let's say that for ISO 27001, you have a December 31st date. So that probably puts your audit season in October, November, let's say. You have a SOC 2 type 2 report that has a January 1st through December 31st audit period. So you're able to align your audit period also to October, November. Great. Those are in harmony. Maybe you're using the same audit firm, cross-sharing evidence, getting some efficiencies there. But then you have PCI that has a June 30th certification date. So in the middle of the year, your, your team has to go gather audit evidence, go through an audit, and do it again at the end of the year. So it's a duplicate work. So by understanding this across your business, you understand your scope, you understand timing, you can make some strategic decisions like should we realign our PCI audit period to also be end of year. So if I have a harmonized control framework, I could align those audit periods, reuse the same evidence, et cetera. So this is a really important step to pulling off the strategy and actually reducing the burden of the external audit if, you're, if, you're, if your goal is to do that. So this is the step. So there's three things just to recap this stage. So how does, how does context and business objective alignment support the single framework strategy? So one, get your business objectives right. Know what your organization cares about. Help that drive organizational change. Know your scope of compliance requirements, what applies to what, what all of your frameworks are that you need to apply with, and know your timing. When, do, when are those audit periods? When, when is audit season? How do you harmonize your audits? So that's step one. That's that context and business alignment. Tools, um, get in the habit of taking screenshots if you're watching this live, because you can use the QR code later if you want to go download this. Uh, so uh, the security team operating system, that, that if you're having trouble with uncovering business objectives and how that aligns to security, this is a great tool for that. You can download that. It's a guide that I put together. Um, also, if, if you want um, a formal way to define the context and scope and business alignment of your organization, I think ISO 27001 is a, ha, has a great process to do that. It's called an ISMS. So if you're trying to get ISO certified, this is mandatory. But even if you're not trying to get ISO certified, this might be a useful thinking model to build that out. And I have a video that's private on YouTube. It's not public. But if you go to this link, uh, you can go watch that. And I literally walk through an entire ISMS. And I have an example ISMS up side by side. And I talk through it in detail. The video is about an hour or so. Actually, I think it's about 20 minutes, it's pretty short. Um, and it uh, will walk you through everything you need to know to kind of think about this. I think it's a great guide. All right, so let's talk about step two and building out a governance structure for this. So uh, step two for me is security program oversight. So how, why do you need security program oversight and what does that mean? So for one, know that security program oversight is required by every major security framework. So if you're doing NIST, if you're doing SOC 2, if you're doing ISO 27001, they all require it. So this is an audit requirement, period. So you have to do it anyway. But it's also a very useful and meaningful tool if you're trying to build out a security or a single framework strategy. So number two is the governance structure is going to help provide oversight and decision making for the single framework strategy. It's a forum to make those decisions and to drive organizational change. This will be a theme in this governance thing. So you need the right people at the table to make these decisions. So two things. So one, I suggest that you form an information risk council. Uh, that might also be called a security risk council, an information security committee, whatever, but it's some governing body. I use information risk council to, to make those decisions to authorize things, authorize policy. We'll talk about the what all it does here in a second, but you need to form that. And then number two, you gotta have a, a cadence of accountability for the Information Risk Council. So they need time and place to be meeting regularly to hold business. So what does a, an Information Risk Council do? So if you don't, where I've seen a lot of organizations get stuck is they don't have a formal place to make decisions. 
um, in terms of how do I approve policy? How do I get buy-in to move audit time periods? How do I confirm scope and get buy-in on that? Who signs off on reports? That is your IRC. It is, you get the right people at the table to do that. They drive culture, they approve policies, they allocate resources. And again, the theme, they help you drive organizational change. So your job is either to form an IRC or to find out who your IRC is and how to get in front of them regularly or improve your IRC to make it functional. That it's not just a meeting, like it's not a group of people who meet begrudgingly every once in a while and it doesn't have the right membership. So make sure you have that. Effective IRC. So number one, write an IRC charter. Uh, our platform Phalanx, if you're in there, there's an IRC charter that you can download and adopt. It's right in the policy uh, templates folder in there. But what the charter does is it gives you formal, official and formal authority and responsibility to make decisions. Because often the IRC is a paper, it's a body in, in formality only, but it can't actually make any decisions or drive change. But that information risk council charter gives them that authority. It authorizes them to act. And it's typically signed by a top level executive. Hopefully you have a top level executive in your IRC. So when you go to make policy decisions, when you say yes to something, you have the confidence that, yeah, that's the body that can actually make that decision. There's no questions about it. It's, it's kind of seems like an administrative task to have a charter, but it's, it's essential to giving them the authority they need to act. Um, also make sure that you have cross-functional representation. So, um, I've seen a lot of IRCs that are, are just like the security leader and their manager. There's there's no one else. There's no one from technology or product or engineering. So it's really just a you know a one-on-one -on -one meeting almost. It, it it lacks the cross-functional representation it needs to have different perspectives to get that authority to drive change. And uh, maybe when you're first standing it up, it makes sense to keep it really tight. So just so you can get it out there, but. Over time, the IRC to be really effective needs to be cross-functional, which means those meetings need to be very valuable. We'll talk about that in a second. And um, lastly, whoever is a member of the IRC, make sure they understand why this is important. Um, I've been part of many IRCs where people show up to that first meeting or they, or they learn that they're a part of it and they're like, why are we here? Why is this important? I'm very busy and I don't want to be part of it yet another committee. So, but if you can articulate to them, like we talked about earlier, hey, this is how this committee aligns directly with the business's priorities and how we're solving big problems. Well, that's a committee that someone wants to be a part of, which is why it's so important to follow that first step of business context and business alignment. So get your IRC going. And that's gonna be the, the governing body for a lot of what's to follow in the rest of the strategy and, and, every, and every part of the series. Um, I mentioned that membership matters. So one of the things that I see is uh, there's an organization structure, something like this. You have an information risk council, you have an executive leadership team or top level leadership, then you have security ops, you have a product team developing a great product, you have IT, you have finance, HR, um, but, but you need cross-functional membership. So what I recommend is get someone from risk and compliance, get your security ops folks in there, a representative from product, if you can, if you have like a SaaS product or your company builds a product, um, representative from IT because they're probably deploying laptops, they're probably managing network security, and then any other key departments. And that's going to vary a little bit from business to business, but maybe it's your general counsel or maybe it's the, the head of HR, whoever that is. See if you can get them in that room. Um, and what that's going to do is going to set that meeting up for success, but it's also going to mean that you have to be extremely accountable not to waste those people's time and make those meetings, make the, the IRC a very meaningful thing. But the, the companies that I've worked with that do this well, it is absolutely worth the time and it, and it changes the whole game in terms of the, the effectiveness of their security and compliance program. Uh, the second thing when you're, when you're talking about oversight is the, the meeting cadences. So it's not enough just to have an IRC that never talks. Uh, you have to actually set up a cadence of accountability and create a designated time and place for that body to talk, share information, and make important decisions. Um, when we build out these programs, so when we go to build out a security program, I usually recommend to start with quarterly. That seems like a good cadence. It's not overly burdensome on an already busy team, but it's also frequent enough to stay up to date. I've also seen some teams do it monthly 
or maybe start out monthly and then and then go to quarterly later once you establish a good good rhythm. That's up to you. But you really want to make sure that you have that meeting cadence and that everyone agrees on what you're going to cover during that meeting. Um, we have a, a if you're if you're a phalanx user, there's an example information risk council meeting agenda in there with a lot of slides that you can pull from that'll give you some great ideas. But ultimately you want that information to be timely, accurate, and prioritized. So whatever decisions need to be made, whatever information they need to make those decisions they're getting. Where I've seen this go wrong is bad meetings that ultimately people don't want to show up to or they're they're very unenthusiastic about showing up to. So here, here's some examples of some things you should talk about if you're in that meeting. So one goal, is everyone crystal clear about the goals that you need to accomplish? So in this example, hey, my goal is to reduce the compliance burden by a thousand hours and a million dollars for your organization by pulling off a single framework strategy. And here's how I'm gonna do it. That's a pretty clear goal that probably everybody can get around, but they need to have a, a clear set of goals. Probably also articulate the compliance requirements. Is everybody aware that you have to be ISO, SOC 2, you have HIPAA requirements, and that's going to impact the business, that there's contracts on the line if you don't do this, that there's regulatory authorities? What are those compliance requirements and how do they impact the business? That's essential. Um, also, the timing of the audit requirements we talked about earlier. Um, and most importantly, is this is an opportunity to have influence and drive organizational change, especially by being able to articulate the business benefits and return on investment for any strategy, especially a single framework strategy. Because probably what's happening in your organization is everyone is used to the status quo. The audits drive the activity, and as long as the audits are passed, no one cares that much until the next audit season. Or you're, you have a net new audit program that you have to spin up and you have to somehow motivate the organization to adopt this new level of formality that they've never done before. Or they really are burdened and everyone's hurting, but they don't know how to fix the problem. Either way, the key is having this group so that you can put a business case together, communicate the plan and the ROI and the needs from this team to ultimately drive the change. So I highly recommend this. This is what I think you should talk about. So this is step two, we talked about oversight. Remember, one, Form an information risk council. It's got to be cross-functional, a lot of communication. It's got to be on point, talking about the right things at the right time. And number two, once you form that, establish a meeting cadence so you can create a dedicated time and space to have these very important conversations that will ultimately drive the organizational change you're trying to drive. A um, couple resources. So grab screenshots if you can. Uh, one, I, uh, I covered in detail how to build out a risk management program also how you can do it in our platform phalanx but even if you're not a phalanx customer this is highly valuable um, you can do it's still very relevant content and if you're in phalanx or you want to know how phalanx supports it i cover it in detail i'll give you the whole system to building out a risk management program including the ircs doing risk assessments having a risk register you can watch that on youtube uh, it's out there on, on the link or, or use this qr code the second uh, resource i'm going to point you all to is everything that you need to do this is in phalanx uh, we do have a free version that you can you can check out if you go to phalanxdrc.com and apply for that free account or if you're a risk 360 customer or you want to uh, do one of the paid platforms hop in there check it out go to phalanxdrc.com we have uh, risk council charters uh, information risk council meeting examples we have a risk register where you can do risk analysis and bubble up top level issues a lot of really good stuff in the platform so if you have access to that and you're not using it, that is a resource you have available to you right now that I hope that you use. And if you don't know how to use it, reach out to us and we'll help you. All right. So this is it. This is the last thing that we're going to talk about today. Number three, organizational structure. So this is a key element to pulling off the single framework strategy. There's two things that you need to think about. One is what is your security functions? Meaning, do you have an operating model? What are the pillars? of topics that your security and GRC program talk about and need to do? What are the jobs? And the second thing is, if you know your jobs, what are the roles and responsibilities of each of those functions and who owns them? Um, so ask yourself right now, do you know all the security functions in your organization? Could you name them? Under those functions, do you know all the roles and responsibilities? And furthermore, do you know who owns them? Who's accountable for that thing? And, and what job do they do? If you don't have a, if you can't access that information or you don't know that answer to that, this is gonna be extremely valuable and a mandatory step 
to pulling off the single framework strategy. The bottom line is you need to know what all jobs need to be done, who owns those jobs, do the, does the person that owns them know that they own it, and do they know how to do it, do they know how to do that job, and how can you be an accountability partner to that person to help them? Let me give you an easy example. So maybe one of the jobs that has to be done for your organization is quarterly user access reviews. Well, who owns all of those jobs? Do they know that they own it? And do they, know, do they know how to do that effectively? And how can you be an accountability partner to let them know that they need to do that? How are you giving them alerts? Are you using a platform like Phalanx GRC that alerts them they need to do it? Are you reaching out to them? So this is, that's an example, but there's, there's hundreds of jobs that need to be done and everyone needs to know it, especially if you're pulling off a single framework strategy that has custom control requirements. So how do you do this? So step one in your org structure journey is gonna be, you have to define the security functions. This is a security operating model. So when we do it, we define about seven or eight of them. There's things like corporate security, detect and respond, GRC, product security, et cetera. So as a security leader, you or you need to work with your security leadership team to define these functions and make sure that they're comprehensive. Um, I'm gonna give you a resource here in a second that will have this done for you. So if this seems overly burdensome, there's a downloadable that you can have here in just a second. But you need to do that. So here's an example that I gave you. Corporate security, detect and respond, GRC, product security, third-party risk, project management, and shared services. And then each of these have sub-duties that need to be done. So uh, that, that's our seven functions. So if you want to take a screenshot of this, you can. I'll also give you a downloadable uh, here in a minute so you can have this. So first step, define those functions so you know what needs to happen across the business. And what you're going to find is this is probably cross-organizational, probably cross-functional in nature. That means if you're going to pull off the single framework strategy, you're probably going to have controls that you know about, but someone else is responsible for operating. You have to educate them. They need to operate those controls. They're probably going to have to gather evidence on your behalf. Maybe you're going to have to be an accountability partner to help them know that they need to execute that, et cetera. So this is a key, key part of your strategy. So once you've, just, once you've defined those functions, the next step is actually, actually drill down in a level of detail and define all of the duties for that function and all of the owners. So in this example, I'm using the, the classic RACI diagram, responsible, accountable, consulted, informed. So let's take detect and respond. Maybe there's a couple of jobs. You have to do vulnerability management, incident response, and monitoring. Or for vulnerability management, John does it. He's responsible. Jane's accountable. She makes sure it happens. Sometimes you have to talk to Will because he knows a lot of stuff, so you have to consult him. And Tom's the, uh, you know, he's an IT, so you have to inform him that it happened. But everyone knows that SOC 2, ISO 27001, NIST, all have a vulnerability management requirement, PCI, vulnerability management requirement. So you need to make sure that these people know that they own that function, they know how to execute the function, they know when to do it, they know how to provide the audit evidence, and you're keeping track of that. You can do that however you want to do it. Phalanx has some capabilities to do that, but it's an essential. The first step is just defining it. You have to define that. So I'm going to cover a couple of quick examples with you so you know what I'm talking about, but this information is something you can download um, and work through yourself. I think it'll be a good exercise, uncover some gaps. So uh, let's talk about uh, two functions. So one, executive and governance. So someone in the security and GRC program has to do executive work and they have to govern the program. So for example, who reports to the board of directors or the executive team? So the responsible party, the person actually doing the work, maybe that's the director of information security, but the person accountable for that, maybe that's the chief information security officer. But you know that you have to consult IT, you have to consult other analysts on the security team to get the right data, and then ultimately you have to inform the board of directors. Well, there's a lot of parties involved in operating that control. And it's very helpful for your whole team to know that. So that you have, if you have to hand off that responsibility, if you have to cross train someone on that responsibility, or you have to track down the information to figure out who owns it, you can do that. It's also a great step for program continuity. So let's pretend that you have this whole thing uh, filled out and the responsible party for all of these is John. Well, John leaves the business and Jane is hired. Well, now you can replace John's name with Jane's name and you have a really good sense, and Jane does too, of all of her new responsibilities to be successful and maintain this program. The other thing you're going to do is you're going to uncover gaps. You're going to say, well, it looks like, wow, I didn't know that Jane owned so much. She has no time to do this. We need to hire an extra resource. 
or perhaps the the position is vacant altogether. So there is no Jane and there's no responsible party. There are control gaps. We have to, to hire someone or ask someone to fill in for that position. It will uncover all sorts of gaps and opportunities for, for improvement for your program. Uh, here's another one. So information technology. I like this one because sometimes uh, people forget that security is very, very cross-functional. So IT plays a key role in security. Often they own things like endpoint management, email security. They're responsible for the asset management program. So who is that? So endpoint security. All right, John over in help desk does the work for endpoint security. The CIO is accountable for making that happen. But guess what? They consult the security team to make sure that they have the right solution in place. And then you guys have to inform the IRC together to make sure endpoint security is happening and happening well. That's very helpful to know because now there's argue, there's a group of individuals, IT, that you probably have no authority over, but you have to influence them to operate controls to have a successful program. And, and IT needs to know that. They need to know they have skin in the game to pull off this program. So there's about 100, bottom line is there's seven functions. There's about 100 or, or more uh, different roles. And if you don't have those well-defined, I'll give you a template here in a second, like I mentioned, where you can start filling that out, start going down that journey. So for this last step, one, clearly define your functions. It's going to be your operating model. That's your seven core function. And then for each function, define all the roles and responsibilities. Make sure roles are assigned, that all the owners understand that they own that responsibility. They know why. Um, un uncover any resource constraints. So if you know, one person owns 20 things, maybe they can't do that effectively. Uh, help provide continuity if you have turnover. So if Jane leaves the business and you need to replace Jane with John, well, John now knows what he needs to do. And, and what I love about this from a GRC and security perspective, now you can be an effective accountability partner. You have people to reach out to to help them do their job better and to know what and how they need to do the job. Um, highly recommend using a GRC platform if you have one um, to, to get all of this in there. But even if it's an Excel document or something like that, that's better than nothing. Template, I promise the template. So go download the RACI template. It's also available right now in the webinar uh, that you can download so you can grab that. Um, but here's the template that we put together. Grab the QR code or, or visit our website in our white paper section. You can download that and start filling it out. Highly valuable. All right, so let's do a quick recap and we'll talk about next steps. So what do we accomplish today? So we talked a lot about governance. Remember, this is a multi-part series where today is governance, we'll talk about policy next, then we'll talk about risk management program, and then we'll talk about continuous monitoring and opportunities to automate. But in the governance category today, we talked about context and business alignment. So don't forget, you need to know why the business needs to do this so that you can drive organizational change, understand what value information security is providing. You know, which frameworks are applicable to you, you have timing implications, you know which business units, the scope, you have all the prerequisite information to drive this strategy, context and business alignment. Then you have to establish an oversight committee of some kind. That's through the Information Risk Council and also a cadence of accountability, probably a quarterly meeting cadence with that group so that everybody has the right information at the right time. Again, you can drive organizational change, you can make decisions, you can pull this strategy off effectively. And lastly, you want the right organization structure. You need to define the functions, the seven core functions, and then you need to jo define which jobs need to happen, who owns those jobs, do they know that they own them, and do they know how to do those jobs, and can you be an accountability partner for them? Again, this is a prerequisite for you pulling off the strategy. I haven't demoed failings today, and there's a reason. It's because no matter what GRC platform you use, or if you use no GRC platform at all, these steps must be completed for you to set up the rest of the program successfully. And I, and I, I want to emphasize that you do that. And I'm going to share with you some tools, some of it in Phalanx, some of it as downloadables that you can download. But just remember that. So um, as a reminder, we've covered governance today. Our, our next step in the series, uh, which is I think what a lot of people want, really want to get into the meat of, is policy. So I'm going to, I'm going to talk about policy architecture. I'm gonna give you examples of policies, how to pull off a policy structure that's harmonized across frameworks that actually meets the needs of the business, that uh, reflects the reality of the business, how policy is an opportunity for you to articulate your intent, get it on paper and get it out into the field, how to roll policy out, how to manage it, how to get people to adopt it, all that stuff. I'm gonna talk a lot about policy. 
That is May 25th. So go ahead and mark your calendar. That's a Thursday. We always do webinars on Thursdays. Thursday, May 25th, I'll talk all about policy. Then I'll talk about risk management. So establishing a, a risk assessment process, processing risk, uncovering risk, getting risk treatment, driving action plans. Uh, risk management is a, a requirement for virtually every compliance framework. And then lastly, I will talk about, I know everyone's anxious to get to this, the controls mapping across frameworks. Uh, we'll provide examples of that. We'll talk about a basis for control mapping, how to do that, pitfalls, pros and cons. And we'll also talk about how to automate a lot of those controls. And that's where I'll demo a little bit of Phalanx as well, because we have some great automation opportunities in Phalanx. So if you want to stop gathering all of the evidence manually, or you want to continuously monitor your control status, you can do that. But whether you use Phalanx or not, we'll talk about that control mapping and, and automation opportunities that you can do internally, but also with tools. And, and that'll be the framework. So again, go ahead and register or, or at least mark your calendar for that May 25th event uh, that's coming up. That's the next part of our webinar. Um, last thing I'll, I'll leave you guys with before we take questions is uh, there's a summary of this entire strategy. Uh, our single framework strategy white paper that I wrote probably a year ago that will give you a really good overview of, of this of what to expect in the series that if you need some words to play back to your team some concepts to think about so that uh, you can put the word put the idea to your team and talk about what needs to be done this is a great white paper for that it's a bit tactical in some areas but mostly it's strategic it gives you the strategy around it, it gives your team something to think about core concepts the benefits if you need to uh, report it up to management and make a pitch on why you need to do this um, I think it's a great white paper. Um, I've gotten real good feedback on it. Uh, a lot of people help contribute to this and inform those ideas, but you can download that uh, also available in the webinar for download right now. Uh, last thing, so I, I wanna go ahead and take questions, Corey. So if y'all have questions, uh, please do throw them in the, the chat right now. We'll start taking those. Um, I'll, I'll keep this screen up right now. Um, so if y'all wanna sign up for Phalanx or check it out, you can go to phalanxdrc.com. I mentioned earlier that we have something called the essentials version. So if you want to uh, sign up for that, try it out for free, um, give it a spin, go in there and use it, see if it's useful to you, just check it out because you're curious, you can do that. Um, so I'll leave this up. But Corey, I'll go ahead and take questions if anybody has any. Yeah, um, Christian, we actually have two so far. Guys, please feel free, it's good, ask them. Uh, the first one is, I am a new CISO, looking for any resources that can coordinate me, myself, into my new role. Do you recommend any upcoming webinars or additional resources that might help? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, let me point you to, uh, so if you're new, uh, if you're a new, a new security leader, a new CISO, or, or a new GRC analyst even, we actually put together a 90-day uh, checklist of things that you can do to be extremely effective in the role. So it includes the 90-day uh, checklist. There's a security assessment template if you want to have a really nice dashboard that you can generate. There's also um, a board reporting template if you need to like, you know, present your first 90 days to the board and a couple other free downloads that are included in that packet. Um, Corey, if you wouldn't mind, maybe we can throw a link in there so people can download that. But th those are basically our best resources for that initial onboarding, making a huge impact in your organization right away and you can download that. Yeah, guys, I actually I went ahead and sent it out to everyone. So if you want to check out that page, you can. Uh, our next question is, are there any good rebuild assessments and fan links that can help me with ISO 27701? Yes, um, I didn't demo fan links today, but yeah, if you need um, any virtual, there's, there's dozens of frameworks. So bottom line, if you have a framework need, there are pre-built templates for that in fan links. So ISO 27001, which is security, ISO 27701, which is privacy, SOC 2, and others. Uh, we have the controls as well as the evidence requests pre-built in Phalanx. And then for each control, we have guidance and descriptions on why it's important, links to important resources. So we really tried to, I guess, uh, we call it platform intelligence. So more than just an Excel spreadsheet, there's a lot of good information about those frameworks that as you click through them, you'll have and some capabilities to map across frameworks all in Phalanx. So if you're looking for something around a specific control framework, we do have that in Phalanx. And if you can't find it, uh, shoot us a note offline and we'll point you to it. Cool. Uh, our next question is like, like how can you handle ERM security team risk management and local function risk management, i.e vulnerability team and SOC team. All right, so 
I'm going to rephrase the question. So ERM, enterprise risk management. Then you have your security risk management. Then you have local team risk, such as vulnerability management in your security operations center. Um, so they'll be, so good question. There's going to be some decisions you have to make there. Um, one decision is what is the relationship between enterprise risk management and security risk management? I've seen some organizations who, uh, whose security is a sub team of enterprise risk management because enterprise risk management is probably considering things like company cash flow, um, going concerns, uh, exchange rates across companies, probably all sorts of stuff depending on the type of your company. And one of the risks that they're concerned with is cybersecurity risk. So A, cybersecurity could be a subcommittee of your enterprise risk management function. So that's a common setup. And then when it comes to vulnerability management, vendor management, all the sub functions of your IRC, uh, your, your op, I've seen two common options. One is you can make those sub functions members of your information risk council. So there's, they're, represented, they're represented. Or two, uh, you can have those sub functions provide necessary information to a central point of contact who can bring it to the IRC. Uh, there's a term called commander's critical information requirements. That's CCIR, uh, which basically is what is the what is the minimum information that those functions need to provide a leader for the leader to make decisions? So as a leader, maybe you define those, those uh, data points, you communicate them to the vulnerability management team or whoever else, and they roll it up to you on a periodic basis so that you can roll it up to your boss if you're a member of the IRC. So, so those are some of the options that I've seen. Uh, that's a great question. Whoever reached out to that, shoot us an email. We can expand on that a little bit more and talk about your specific scenario. But generally speaking, that's how that can be handled. Cool. So we have um, a few more questions. Um, do you have any FTC safeguard controls? Um, I, I, I do not think that that's in Phalanx. I, I don't think so. Um, but what I'll say in Phalanx is there's the capability to create any custom control framework you want. So one of the things that we'll do with clients is if you have like a nuanced control framework or even a custom control framework that we for some reason don't have in the platform itself, uh, we, we can create that on your behalf. Uh, we can go out there, download the framework, get it in Phalanx and put it up there. Um, so we can create it or you can create it yourself if you want to self-serve. So there is the capability to custom control frameworks. I don't think that that one's in there by default. All right, um, we have another one. Um, when my external auditor is using a different tool for audits and my company is using a different tool for GRC, integration seems to be challenging in managing audits and evidence. Uh, do oh, you yeah. have any suggestions on how to fix this issue? So I, I, I hear you. Absolutely. This is such a struggle. It's like we're in tool overload where everybody has a tool and, and they won't talk to each other. So there's a couple options I would recommend uh, when it comes to that. Um, so what, let me just tell you what we do. So with Phalanx, we, we run into that exact same problem because what we do is we build, we're either the auditor ourselves or we've built the security program on behalf of the client. So we're interfacing with the auditor, with the client. Um, but since we use Phalanx, the two ways that we handle it is one, uh, we, we do have a mechanism where we can just download everything into a really clean zip file to hand off to the auditor and put it in their platform if they make us do that. Um, but we at least tried to make it easy in our GRC platform where it's kind of a one click download everything, hand over to the auditor. Option two is you can create a clean space in Phalanx so that the auditor can self serve and access that information themselves and, um, and, and self serve all the evidence. I've seen both of those work. Um, I know that there's, uh, there's a lot of problems with, uh, for example, audit automations. Uh, like can the auditor trust the audit automation is it comprehensive of the scope is it accurate so some auditors are a little bit uncomfortable with that especially the big audit firms they're they're justifiably concerned about the completeness and accuracy of that evidence um, so you might have to work with the auditor themselves to get them comfortable uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis there could be that um, but again the two two options we typically use with phalanx is either creating a space where the auditor can direct serve or just zip filing everything uh, down and and handing it over to the auditor in their platform. Um, so those are the two solutions. All right, so we have uh, one more question here. Um, what are tasks that are typically considered governance action items? And this is for someone that's new to cybersecurity and has been tasked to handle filling out templates for govern governance. Can you, so I think what I heard was, in, I'm not looking at the question, Corey, repeat this back. It sounds like they're saying, 
Can, can you repeat it? What are the tasks that the governance? Uh, yeah, so they're filling out a, a, a template for cybersecurity for the company. And one of the sections is a template X for governance components. I understand at a high level that governance is the policies, procedures, and processes. What are the tasks that a typical governance action items? Like, what are the, the tasks? I got you. I understand. Okay, got it. Watch this web. Watch this series right here, the risk management guide. It'll tell you exactly that. There's things like a meeting cadence. Uh, there's probably slide decks. There's uh, uh, risk treatment plans. There's confirmation of action items. You you mentioned policy approval. Uh, there's a lot of stuff it could be, but if you look, if you watch this video right here on uh, risk management and executive reporting, I think it'll. Like, It'll give you exactly what you need. It's about 45 minutes. So I recommend watching uh, this video and it will answer that in detail for you. Cool. And I'll, I'll also send it out to you in a few seconds. Um, one more question. Well, several more questions. Uh, can you point out any resources on failing of a security program, especially in the healthcare sector, as the majority of orgs in healthcare have low maturity? Uh, can I point out resources and, and are they looking for resources to further mature their program or like stats? Do you get a sense? I guess to help them not fail. Um, okay. Them. Well, uh, Phalanx. <laughs> Phalanx TRC will help you understand. Yeah. There's a lot of data platform. So let me point you to a couple things uh, I think are good resources. Let me think through this. So one, uh, Risk360 YouTube channel. We, uh, we're very good about systematizing things and explaining them in this way. So I think conceptually, how to build out a security program, common pitfalls, things to think about, best practices for free. Check out the Risk360 YouTube channel and just and, and look at the playlist and see if any of that helps you and kind of answers those questions. Uh, we talk about healthcare specific stuff. We talk about high trust and HIPAA in some of the videos. Um, the second thing I'll point you to is um, Health and Human Services site uh themselves so uh if you go to uh healthcare uh, help the healthcare like whoever the governing body of hipaa themselves they have a website and they have uh, excel documents and policy templates for example they have like a, a hipaa security assessment checklist they have example policies and stuff like that it's, it's very generic and i wouldn't say it's the best stuff but if you're just kind of looking to get started that might you can at least get their perspective on what to do what not to do um, I mentioned Phalanx already. There's a self-assessment tool in Phalanx where you can kind of do the TurboTax model of a, of a security program. You can download policies, things like that. Um, those are good resources. Another favorite I have is the Center of Internet Security, CIS. They have the SANS Top 18. It used to be called the SANS Top 20 uh, or CIS Top 20. Now it's the Top 18. That is a, a security framework um, that I think is practically applied. In terms of you can you can look at that control framework and you can it's like a doing framework it shows you what you need to do and there's different implementation groups and they also have lots of free resources templates stuff like that they even have benchmarking uh like configuration setting uh stuff so between those resources i think that those are i would point you to those i think they're they're good places to get started i hope that's helpful all right we have several more um are BC cell services traditionally billed on a month-by-month basis? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> uh, so we so we do have a, um, one of a, one of the products that we offer as a company is virtual CISO services. The other way to say that is it's kind of a compliance as a service or GRC as a service offering. Whereas we, you know, if if your company has a SOC two requirement or an ISO requirement or many requirements, we can come in and completely own that function with you. So we'll help operate controls. We'll help govern it. We have a, we have a playbook to do this. Uh, and under that model, what we do is we bill monthly. So we, it's a fixed fee engagement. We bill monthly. We'll do some scoping and stuff to kind of understand levels of effort. But at the end of the day, it's a, it's a monthly resource. Huge ROI, by the way. What we find is like it's light years better and more cost affordable and what you get out of it than trying to build the team internally, basically because we've made a playbook on exactly how to execute this. So you can check out our website. If you go to risk360.com, there's like a VCISO page and it talks a little bit about it, but to answer a question directly, monthly. All right, we have 
You have more questions today. Very, this is a very popular uh, webinar. Keep so. coming, baby. Let's go. All right. What? So, uh, my company made an acquisition recently um, of a company who does not have SOC and only has ISO. So my company has all stock to has SOC, ISO, and PCI. How do we do a gap analysis and remediate them to ensure they are audit ready? All right. So I went to this this slide right here because this is the scope of your compliance effort. So often when a company acquires another company, there's, a, there's a one key decision at least that needs to be made. And that decision is, are you gonna leave that company alone and let them operate autonomously? Or are you gonna pull them in and require that they adopt your corporate shared services? So for example, are you gonna be corporate security for them? Are you gonna require them to use your laptops? Do they have to VPN now? Do they have to adopt your SaaS tools? Because if they do, then you need to govern that. You need to do a gap assessment. You need to have a strategic plan to implement all that stuff. Um, if you're not, if you're going to let them operate autonomously, well, then you can just do a gap assessment against them as a standalone because presumably they've been operating by themselves the whole time. Most commonly, what I see is a crawl, walk, run approach where maybe that first year they're kind of operating autonomously. You don't want to mess them up too bad. So you do the gap assessment against them as a current state. And then year two, as you as they adopt your corporate services, you take note of those and make sure that those are well adopted. For example, you're implementing their laptops, so now you own that control. Uh, now they're part of your IRC, so they need to be part of that control. Now they're adopting your policies and procedures, so they need to adopt that. So there is an m &A strategy to all of this. And if you're, you're seeking certification like SOC 2, um, what I would specifically do is consider, A, should you do two separate reports that first year, uh, just to get them a report? And then maybe in future years, do a combined report because the scope will be harmonized enough where it won't disrupt you. Or do you want to go all in that first year and see if there's enough uh, opportunity to bring them into the scope and, uh, and, and do one SOC 2 report? We, we deal with this all the time. We work with a lot of high growth tech companies that are heavy on the acquisition mode. So that's a question I would love to cover in more detail. So if you shoot us a note, we'll, we'll walk through exactly maybe what you need to think about, some of the strategic planning elements of that. But at a high level, that's what I would do. All right, cool. Uh, we have some more. Um, are frameworks like SOC 2 evolving rapidly? Will SOC 2 matter in five to 10 years? Yes, to both. So, so let's just talk about the trend real quick. And that's probably the last question because it's going to take me two minutes. So the bottom line is, is cybersecurity is going to be like a $10.5 trillion criminal enterprise over the next five to 10 years. Um, that's going to translate in a huge amount of compliance and regulatory requirements for every company to continue to do business with each other. So the writing is on the wall that these frameworks are going to continue to evolve. They're going to continue to be viable. They're probably going to become more stringent and the requirements are going to change over and over again because technology is evolving so rapidly. So yes, it is SOC 2 and others are going to be viable. They're going to continue. They're going to be more rigid, and you're going to have to do more of it. So everything is more. So there, there is no avoidance strategy, really. If you're a B2B company, you're providing services, especially technology services, to another business. This is your reality, and there's huge money on the line for your organization because what you're going to find is you probably can't do businesses with other businesses without this stuff. So uh, yeah, you need a strategy for that. And yes, it's going to be viable. Yes, it's going to continue to evolve. Just this year. Uh, ISO 27001 upgraded to version 2022. PCI is moving to version 4.0. SOC 2 is governed by the AICPA. It hasn't been updated in a while. I can guarantee they're going to update it at some point. Um, CMMC 2.0 is, is, is uh, out and, and being adopted. So lots of change. If you're employed in this industry, that's good news. That means that you have a, a big purpose to fulfill in the marketplace. But it's going to be complex. So uh, absolutely gear up for that. So maybe one more, Corey, and we'll close it down here. All right, this is the last one. Um, what would you suggest as key attributes for an exec reporting for security and data um, in a healthcare company with over 500 plus organizations under it with one program? Ooh, I, you need to call me because that's a complicated answer. So for real, uh, shoot us an email. We'll talk about that. Um, let me Instead of answering that, let me point you to a resource. So we, uh, in that ISMS video that we had, we actually cover great KPIs uh, that you might want to consider uh, as a roll-up from lots of sub-organizations 
up to a, a, a centralized security function. Um, in addition, you're probably gonna be thinking about things like, do you need business information security officers? So if you're at the top level at corporate, are you gonna assign regions to other directors or, or security officers who's ultimately gonna roll up to you? There's a big org structure question here. And also how common are all of, if you have 500 business units, I imagine they're not all the same. You're probably gonna have regional stuff. You're probably gonna have big hospitals, little hospitals, pharmaceutical, you're gonna have all sorts of stuff. So you have to categorize and bucket, bucket them based on risk. So one, there's a really complex org structure conversation to have here and how you wanna roll up information and push down information that needs to be decided. Then once you do the grouping amongst all of those, you gotta think about specific risk and KPIs that matter that you wanna roll up. So that, that's a great one for a conversation. So if you wanna have a conversation about that, shoot me a note and we can do that. I think the ISMS Masterclass maybe give you some ideas. There's also some blog posts and a white paper that we have out on security organizational structure. So if you Google RISC 360 security organizational structure, some stuff will come up. Those might be helpful resources, but that's one that's so loaded and complex, we should probably talk about it if you want to. So so I, that was the last one. Hey, let me tell you guys, thank you so much for being engaged. This was awesome. I love all the questions at the end. I hope this content was valuable for you guys. Um, and what I would really love is if all of you show up again for the next part. So mark your calendars for May 25th. I'm trying to get to that slide so you can see it. May 25th is the next part of this. Go ahead and sign up for that. Prepare some questions, send to Corey in advance. We'll be happy to help. So again, thank you everybody. Hope this was valuable. Looking forward to the next one.